Good morning, everyone. Um, it's true, I've got, a, I've got a legal background, and I'm actually a business ethics professor here in Hong Kong. I, I teach at the University of Hong Kong, and I've been asked to speak today on, on kind of the, the overall climate in terms of social entrepreneurship and, and these types of aspects of, of the business, the regular business community and climate within Hong Kong, and then also to specifically kind of look at my role and what I do with my students. And I um, just kind of was thinking as I was sitting there, it's, it's a little bit of a dangerous proposition because as a lawyer and as a business ethics professor, I'm an inherently cynical guy. And, and so to come up and to kind of describe the, the environment uh, within Hong Kong, I was thinking about how to approach it. And the reality is, I think as, as Teresa has shown, is there are a lot of wonderful, wonderful people in Hong Kong. It is, it is kind of a commercial business first type of place for the most part. But as someone who works directly with uh, MBA level and undergraduate students every single day, and as someone who left the commercial and private sphere um, intentionally to, to kind of devote my life to these types of projects and goals, um, I can say that, that Hong Kong is, is a, a kind of a budding and, and ripening environment for these types of um, non-commercial or not non-specifically commercial types of activities. Now, um, it being Hong Kong, we all do still try to make money. We, we, sustainability means, uh, to a certain extent, profitability as well. And so we do focus on those types of aspects of business. But at the same time, um, the thing that has really struck me, uh, so I came to Hong Kong as, as, as an attorney, worked here for a few years for one of the big international law firms from the US, and then uh, shifted over to Hong Kong U. And the amazing thing is I've taught um, at Fudan University and, and Hong Kong U at the MBA level and undergraduate level, the, the amazing thing to to me that I've never really understood. I've never taken a business class. I'm probably the only person in this room who's never actually taken a business class. Um, the amazing thing was the, the intense desire for something that was like something different, something better. No one could really define what it was. No one really could explain what it was they were looking for necessarily, but perhaps a different way to conduct business. Um, and so we see these types of ideals, you know, permeating in concepts of corporate social responsibility and corporate philanthropy and now social entrepreneurship and whatnot. Um, and, and these are the things that have kind of I've been exposed to. It's been it's been very interesting to me to see kind of how they've permeated uh, to give a very quick background of, of soap cycling and uh, the other uh, where the serial part of the entrepreneur uh, comes in is because I, I, I noticed as I was teaching at Hong Kong U that you had this, this group of young students. I mean, the students in Hong Kong, you cannot understand. They're wonderful. They're smart and they're strong and, and they, they want so badly to, to produce something that is great for the world. They live in this very small, isolated place and they want to somehow make a difference in the larger world. Uh, and yet, because of the nature of the environment and, and the legal environment and different things and also cultural pressures and family pressures, they've been taught their entire life that they have one role, one role, to memorize and to study and to do. Their currency is grades, right? Their achievement, their definition of success is grades to a certain extent, and that's fine. Um, but they get to university seeking something different, seeking something more. And so as I was trying to provide opportunities, especially for my, my undergraduate students, something beyond getting coffee, something beyond making copies, um, I realized that unfortunately, if we were going to provide the opportunities that I thought they deserved, we were going to have to create them ourselves. And so we just started forming companies. And, and I, I went to the students. I said, if I start these companies, will you run them for me? And the students said yes. And, and they, they've taken it on. And, and now um, soap cycling is the specific example that we're going to show today. Um, but we've, we've uh, founded uh, two companies. And we've got a few other projects that are not officially um, formed or incorporated yet. Um, but it's, it's been very kind of uh, wonderful to see the growth from the students and within um, the community and the way they've kind of embraced what we're trying to do in the overall aspect of it. So now this story. <clears throat> this picture was taken in a, in a place called Tondo in <clears throat> just outside of Manila. It is, if you close your eyes and imagine the most dirty and um, unsanitary place you could possibly imagine, that is Tondo. Um, now, I love the Philippines. I'm not trying to discredit uh, the Philippines. It's a wonderful, beautiful place with, with strong and resilient people. It's just this particular community uh, is a little bit unsanitary because it was built on top of a landfill. And the, the children and families that live there are quite literally the poorest of the poor. Even within, even within the Philippines, these are the poorest of the poor. And this particular young man, 
You can see in his left hand there that, um, uh, I mean, well, first of all, look at his face. That's, that's the more important place to look. This is a strong, resilient, happy young man. He has no shoes. He doesn't have clothing that you and I would perhaps consider adequate. And yet he is, he's just an incredibly happy young man. And um, we, we met him as we were going through Tondo, working with a, a program called Project Pearls, and um, happened to be able to give him uh, the bar of soap in his left hand. And he immediately ran over into an alleyway where there was a bucket of water and started bathing himself. Um, this is what uh, we at Soap Cycling do. With my students, we decided to work with local hotels in Hong Kong and within the region. We collect the used soap. For example, uh, if you stay at the, the Renaissance here or the JW or any of the hotels in the region, Upper House, uh, the Grand Hyatt, uh, these are all hotels that, that take the soap that you use. And when you leave the hotels, they, we, pr we collect it. They provide it to us. And then we re reprocess that soap and send it to communities like Tondo. Uh, obviously, with Typhoon Haiyan, which just, which just passed through um, the Philippines, uh, we've been lucky to send a couple hundred thousand bars of soap there, and we've got another shipment of nearly 3,000 kilos of soap that's going to be going out this week as well, all soap that otherwise would have been sent to the landfills uh, here in Hong Kong and elsewhere. Um, we've been very, very lucky to have partnerships with wonderful partners here in Hong Kong and elsewhere. And actually tomorrow, no, excuse me, Thursday, we've got our first shipment. I know there's several delegates from Japan here. Um, we've got our first shipment from hotels in Japan of 1,000 kilos of soap coming from hotels there. So it's really a wonderful thing. So how did it get started? Um, as I mentioned, we're a nonprofit that, that works with these hotels. Um, we are the first kind, uh, in, uh, first of this kind of uh, mass uh, recycling of, of bars of soap in, in, in uh, Asia. And most importantly for our business model, as I mentioned, we are almost entirely staffed by non-paid uh, student volunteers who have specific roles, like leadership roles, but non-paid student um, workers and colleagues from the University of Hong Kong. Um, we, three primary missions. We, we obviously are looking to pr improve sanitation and hygiene, like for that young man in Tondo. But simultaneously, as we do that, we have the added luxury of being able to improve the environmental and landfill conditions here within Hong Kong. So if you think of the, the hotel industry alone, not including um, serviced offices or service departments and stuff, there are somewhere between three and five million bars of soap each year that are thrown away just in Hong Kong. So if you're from Tokyo, if you're from you know, somewhere in Malaysia, Bangkok, wherever you may be from, you can imagine how much soap is thrown away. And, and we're not talking about the gel, the shampoo, the conditioner. We're only talking about the actual physical bars of soap. And so you can imagine how much of this is, is entering our landfills and, and polluting our water and other things. Um, and we're able to take that, repurpose it, and then provide it to those that need it very, very desperately. And then finally, um, from the educational standpoint, I'm a teacher first, businessman second. <laughs> and so we have the opportunity not only to provide sanitation and uh, education within those communities, but more importantly for me, at least more directly for me, I have the opportunity to provide leadership and, and um, youth empowerment education here within Hong Kong, uh, both through soap cycling and the other uh, nonprofit initiatives that we've created. Now, you may not know this, but out of, if you imagine all of the children in the world that are unable to make it to their fifth birthday, so they die before they're five, nearly one third of those die because of a disease that's largely preventable just by giving them a bar of soap at the right time. So if you think of pneumonia, if you think of cholera, you think of dysentery, those are the diseases that are the most prevalent and most dangerous to young people in the world. And yet, um, if you think of the, the, the money that is spent on, on other very worthwhile uh, goals, like you know, HIV, AIDS, and malaria, and these types of things, they're dwarfed, I mean, just dramatically dwarfed by, by the, the number of deaths that come from pneumonia and um, diarrheal types of diseases. And similarly, if you're following the news out of the Philippines after Typhoon Haiyan, they have uh, almost as much problem with cholera, pneumonia, and other dysentery and diarrheal diseases after uh, the typhoon than they've had from the actual deaths occurring from the typhoon now. They have a lot of illness, a lot of um, dehydration. Again, all com almost completely preventable just by uh, providing bars of soap to individuals to, to wash their hands before they go to the bathroom, or excuse me, after they go to the bathroom and before they eat. 
So we, 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 um, we are very, even though we're a very young organization, we're, we're just barely over a year old, we're very happy to say that we've been able to send soap to 10 countries, which in and of itself is, is you know, not that big of a deal, but we, we are trying to have a more concerted, direct impact. And so, um, as we've mentioned, we focus on very specific types of programs, disaster relief, um, uh, youth education uh, types of things, and antenatal type of um, disease prevention. These are some of our hotel partners. Um, basically all of the major hotels in Hong Kong and now uh, because of a partnership with Hilton Worldwide, uh, which we're, we're going into the, the Hilton hotels through the APAC region and are exploring opportunities with other international um, uh, hospitality partners. Um, th this is just the, the look of some of the children in Ghana and in Vietnam and even within Hong Kong uh, that we've been able to provide soap to. Now Hong Kong is a little bit different. As Teresa mentioned, there is a surprising amount of, um, for lack of a better term, poverty. People that, that need more than perhaps we realize. There's a, a massive amount of wealth in Hong Kong, and so sometimes we ignore those that are truly, uh, uh, just, they need more assistance within Hong Kong. But the, the reality is, from a sanitation and hygiene perspective, we at Soap Cycling can't help them perhaps as much as we can other locations. And so the help that we provide here within Hong Kong is we do a lot of youth empowerment training and education. We work with, um, for example, UNICEF here, um, a lot of public awareness stuff, and then uh, volunteering sessions through CSR teams. Like this, there's a group from PwC, Disney, and other groups there. And we try to help them understand, in fact, the conversation that we had today about how to direct our thoughts today, how it may be applicable to you, as someone who is perhaps not a CSR expert, but someone who looks at corporate social responsibility and business ethics and these types of you know, better business practices as a profession, I can say that businesses can do corporate social responsibility better. We can all be cynical. You can do it for marketing. We can do it for PR and do those other things that we desire and use it to, to, you know, to, to increase our brand or, or, or our business image and do those things while simultaneously exploring your core competencies and really understanding understanding how those core competencies can be applied to nonprofit or social enterprise types of businesses within the community. Um, so as I mentioned, we've, we've been able to send out over 300,000 bars um, so far this year. It will probably be closer to 400,000 bars by the end of December, uh, which for our first year we feel quite proud of. Um, but more importantly, as I mentioned, it's really the number of students that we've been able to employ. Now this was our original business model, which you can't really you know, read, but the point is uh, our, our, org our organizational chart and structure is very similar to any other you know, for-profit or non-profit business that you may see. Uh, we have marketing, we have PR, we have, we have compliance with, with legal and accounting, and all of those are, are filled by university students. And this is what our org chart looks like today. We've expanded from 12 students, now we've got over 40 students that are working for us. Um, it's actually difficult to get students to stop working for us. We have to fire them <laughs> because, I mean, I literally had to fire our entire management team at the beginning of the school year because I said, it's time for you to move on. Um, some of them was actually hurting their grades to a certain extent and their parents were actually kind of getting concerned and were kind of asking me, you know, maybe you could ask them to step away and stuff. And so we did, I mean, in part, not because they weren't doing a great job, they were doing a fantastic job, uh, but because we needed to, to allow other people to have a similar opportunity. And so we've incorporated this now into, now all of this is separate from Hong Kong U. I, I do teach at Hong Kong U, but this is all, these are entities that we've created on our own. But because of um, the support from Hong Kong U, we've been able to incorporate this into our business programs now. And so students can get credit for, for working in these internships. And we've kind of more formalized um, the actual uh, integration of the business program and, and the, the undergraduate um, uh, opportunities. And now we're actually trying to integrate the MBA program as well. And so in the ethics classes that we'll teach in January, we're actually going to integrate some application of, of um, the students' knowledge, the things that they've gained as, as ethics, or excuse me, as, as MBA students and, and as uh, professionals, working professionals, um, into these types of uh, external programs as well. Um, and so just very quickly, just to show you from our very humble beginnings, I mean, I know these students so intimately now that it's, it's amazing to see them. Uh, this is two years ago, and I know every one of these students by name as they, they went with me to find the warehouse space to go, I mean, as you can see, collecting soap in plastic bags because we had no idea what to do. <laughs> we, 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 didn't, we didn't even know what was going on. In fact, we didn't even ask the hotels to send us soap. Uh, <clears throat> 
But to show you how businesses in Hong Kong are looking for something more, they are looking for something better, the hotels actually started collecting soap, even without us asking them to, and we started getting phone calls. They say, hey, we've got soap, we've got soap, when are you going to pick it up? And so we realized, oh crap, <laughs> we, we either have to do this or we have to, we have to burn bridges with them. And so we actually rented this facility and ha- held soap in this facility for an entire year before we even had the, uh, our, our company registered and incorporated. We had over 15,000 kilos of soap in that room um, for for a long period of time, and I'm happy to say that it's all been shipped out now. Um, so the question is, what's next? And, and not specifically for, for soap cycling, but for um, Hong Kong and for, you know, again, the way that I approach it, uh, whether it's, um, you know, a better type of capitalism, as Teresa mentioned, whether it's enlightened self-interest, as Adam Smith, the economist, said, or whether it's just a better way of conducting business. I think that's something that hopefully uh, all of us can be asking ourselves today, because I think, again, as someone, a very idealistic person, I get it, but also simultaneously as a cynic, right, um, I think that we we all can approach these things from, a, from a, a different angle, a different perspective, not only approach corporate social responsibility or corporate philanthropy from the marketing and PR type of perspective, but understand that each one of you and, and the business professionals that work under you have knowledge that is so incredibly valuable to members of society. And, that, and, and again, just from my specific approach within this region, the young generation that we have within Asia, especially including China and India, is without question the most important generation that has ever lived on the face of the earth. If for no other reason, just because of the vast scale and size of that generation. Right? We can talk about environmental sustainability, we can talk about profitability, we can talk about all these different ideals. None of that matters. None of that matters if we don't bring them along for the ride. None of that matters if we can't give them opportunities, not just to give them the concept, the ideas, the leaning, the education, the desire, but actually give them the opportunities to engage in these types of programs and to truly go down this line of what, you know, better business. Otherwise, all this talk of you know, improving uh, you know, the, 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 the amount of ammonium quantity and this and that or, or the pollution levels of, of the different companies really is not really going to matter very much. And so I leave it with that. Um, if you have any questions later on, then, then I, I, I do welcome them. Um, but we're Im- incredibly grateful to be able to share this story with you and, and hope that uh, you know, through this we've been able to perhaps inspire or enlighten you in some way. Thank you. Thank you.